I'm Bill Ariser from Brooklyn Law School, and I'm really delighted to be here today talking about my book, First Amendment Law, Freedom of Expression and Freedom of Religion, which I co-authored with Arthur Hellman from the University of Pittsburgh and Thomas Baker from Florida International University School of Law. Our casebook is driven by a philosophy that, in the First Amendment area, the cases are the law, and the law is the cases. The text of the First Amendment is notably sparse and doesn't by itself answer difficult speech, press, and religion questions. For that reason, it becomes crucial for students to understand what the justices actually say about the First Amendment and, more importantly, more deeply, what their philosophies of the First Amendment are. That philosophy can only come through in the cases themselves. That makes the cases in this area more important than in a lot of other constitutional law areas. Our philosophy influenced the content of the book in three distinct ways. First of all, Given the importance of the cases, we edited the cases with a very light touch. We kept in the justices thinking about the basic theory of free speech, free press, and free religion, uh, and we did not overly chop that more theoretical discussion out of the cases. Um, that, of course, meant that we needed to make some careful decisions about which cases to include, given that we were including large but longer than normal excerpts of the particular cases. Second of all, again, given the importance of the cases, we kept in more citations in the opinions themselves than is normally the case in a casebook. Because the cases are so foundationally important to what the law of the First Amendment is, it's crucial that we provide the students with the case citations that the justices themselves rely on in making their decisions, so that the students themselves can evaluate whether in fact the justices are using precedent appropriately. Finally, our philosophy affects the book, uh, influences the way the book looks, through the organization of the material. We, because the cases are the law, we organize the material as the justices organize their own doctrine. That is to say, the authors did not impose their own particular views about how the cases ought to be understood as relating to each other. Instead, our organization reflects the justices' own choices on that matter. Because First Amendment law is, in fact, so theoretical and sometimes difficult for students to grasp, we made extensive use of problems. We, we liberally interspersed the cases and notes with problems, and indeed, in choosing those problems, we used fact patterns from actually decided cases in the lower courts. The hope here was that the students would be able to apply the precedent they were learning about in actual real-life cases that, in fact, lower courts have confronted. The book does have a teacher's manual. We gave very careful consideration to what ought to be in the teacher's manual. So, for example, we were very careful to provide full explanations of every major part of the book, every major piece of content. Every case, every note is fully explained in the book. In addition, the teacher's manual provides full explanations of the fact patterns and the cases that were the foundations of the notes. A professor using this book is never going to be at a loss for knowledge about what a problem in the casebook uh, actually, uh, 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 how a problem in the casebook was actually decided by a court, what the proper analysis is of any problem in the casebook. In addition, the teacher's manual went further and provided even greater number of problems, problems that we thought maybe didn't in warrant inclusion in the actual book itself, but that if a, if a teacher wanted to use them, uh, 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 could in fact use uh, in the course of a class discussion, or frankly, even as an exam problem. All that's in the teacher's manual. Finally, uh, the teacher's manual includes a variety of syllabi that uh, a teacher can use when constructing his or her own course. First Amendment law can be taught in a lot of different ways, and in constructing and including these sample syllabi, we tried to provide a broad variety of pedagogical approaches. 
just to take an example. We have several syllabi that reflect a standard survey course approach to the First Amendment, but in addition, we have a syllabus that, just to take an example, uh, it, it uh, takes a sort of greatest hits approach to the First Amendment, an approach that focuses only on the most seminal, most famous cases, uh, rather than on uh, all, all of the detail. Uh, Finally, we included syllabi that provide different levels of emphasis as between press, speech, and religion. Simply put, in writing this book, my colleagues and I aspire to write a book that was unobtrusive in the sense that it let the justices speak for themselves, but at the same time, a book that allowed students to grapple with the difficult issues that are raised by First Amendment cases by including problems Problems, again, which the professor has full access to the analysis of in the teacher's manual.